who follows me knows that I recently approached Hyperland and that I had never really tried it until now. Using this system has enlightened me and made me deeply reflect on the evolution and dynamics of the Linux desktop and how Hyperland, for what it represents and offers, is in fact a milestone in desktop history. Just as Compiz and its graphic effects were 20 years ago, pushing both GNOME and KDE and the rest of the ecosystem to change. So what Hyperland does, this time apart from the robust screenshots that are just appearance, it does in a unique and reasonably surprising way, since it's not a window manager born within Red Hat like Compiz, nor a project born in the laboratories of certain proprietary companies we all know. Hyperland is the fruit and the most concrete example of how powerful open source is and how this time, we are the ones ahead. And it's the first time in the history of graphical interfaces. Yes, because for decades we've seen clones of macOS and Aqua, icon sets and wallpapers that wanted to replicate that type of experience on Linux. And we've all seen how the concept of swipe and touch interface was exploited and brought by Apple into the world, not only of phones, but also of computers. Well, Hyperland puts everyone behind this time, and if you look at it and think that Mac OS and Windows 11 are old, that your own GNOME and KDE are old, well, you're not wrong. In my opinion, they are all much older than XFC, believe me. That's why these words are so enthusiastic, because I've never appreciated tiling window managers. Never. I'm a boomer user. I grew up with mouse, icons, taskbar, and menus. I even installed Linux for the first time with floppy disks. So I've never used this modern stuff, let's say. I looked at Hyperland with a lot of superiority and skepticism. It seemed like a game for nerds obsessed with showing they knew how to use Arch Linux. But then the notoriety increased, and finally I approached it. So with my ThinkPad X1 Nano Gen 2, I decided to put Slackware and Hyperland on it. And the experience was shocking, undoubtedly shocking. So much so that, while using a main system with keyboard, mouse, and void Linux with XFCE, I literally miss that experience, and I perceive that my workflow with the laptop and Hyperland is not superior. It's clearly superior. It's about usability. And I believe that on laptops with a high-quality touchpad, well, there's no comparison. There's no desktop that can compete. But even on a classic system, I believe that after an adaptation period, the usability, elegance, and speed with which operations are performed with Hyperland cannot be reached by anyone. There are technical reasons and theoretical reasons why this happens, and I'll explain them later. But today I wanted to delve deeper into the concept of tiling windows and explain to you that actually the computer, the graphical interface, was born precisely with this composition. So let's talk about tiling. Because you know, there's this widespread idea that tiling is a modern thing. Like, oh yeah, those who use i3 on Arch, as if it was born yesterday to look cool on Reddit. But actually the history is much deeper and much stranger than that. Tiling wasn't invented by anyone in particular. There's no guy who one day woke up and said, Eureka, Windows must be side by side. It was born out of necessity, when graphical computers were so slow that every pixel counted, when the mouse was a prototype that cost as much as a car, and when the very idea of moving a window seemed an absurd waste of computational resources. Go back to the 70s, to Xerox Park, this legendary place where they practically invented everything you use today, the GUI, the mouse, Ethernet, the laser printer. When they were developing Smalltalk, one of the first completely graphical systems, Windows didn't float freely like on Windows or Mac. They were side by side. They divided the space. And you know why? Because the goal wasn't to simulate a desk full of scattered papers. The goal was to maximize visible information. The screen was a precious resource. You couldn't afford to hide half the things behind other things. In 1981 came the Xerox Star, the first commercial WYSIWYG system. Technically, it supported overlapping windows, but in daily practice, people used ordered, tiled layouts. Tiling was the operational norm, even though the system allowed otherwise. And it's interesting because already back then there was this tension between what the system could do and what made sense to do. Then something fundamental happens. Apple and Microsoft enter the consumer game. And here they make a choice that isn't technical, it's narrative. They decide that the computer must be a virtual desk. Windows become sheets of paper that you can overlap, move, pile up. 
the mouse becomes central. And tiling? Tiling is seen as too rigid, too professional, not sexy enough for marketing. You can't sell a Macintosh by showing windows that fit together geometrically. You have to sell freedom, creativity, controlled chaos. But in the Unix world, where the window manager is separated from the X11 graphical server, something different happens. There, the programmers, the sysadmins, the people who spend eight hours a day in front of terminals realize that no, actually overlapping windows is madness. In 1999, Ion comes out. In 2000, Rat Poison. And Rat Poison is brutally explicit. Zero mouse, zero overlays, only keyboard. The name itself is a play on words about rat poison, because the mouse is the enemy. Here tiling becomes almost an ideology. Zero distractions, total control, radical efficiency. Then in the 2000s comes a second wave. Awesome in 2007, i3 in 2009, Sway in 2015. These window managers make tiling accessible, introduce dynamic layouts, more human configurations, but they still remain in a niche. They're tools for those who know what they're doing, for those who want to squeeze every millisecond of productivity from their workflow. And here we arrive at Hyperland. Hyperland doesn't invent tiling, but does something revolutionary. It brings it out of the keyboard monk's niche, makes it gesture first, touchpad native. Animations aren't decorations, they're physical feedback that helps the brain track where things are. Swipes aren't a convenience, they're the new lingua franca of interaction. And suddenly tiling is no longer a compromise you make because you're a purist. It's a superior proposal. Or at least, it can be for certain types of use. Because you see, the real insight of tiling isn't windows must fit together. The real insight is that overlapping windows is a legacy of the desk mesk metaphor that never made sense in digital. On a physical desk, you have to overlap because gravity exists and space is limited. But on a screen, you can have infinite workspaces, infinite splits, spatial logics that would be impossible in the physical world. Overlapping windows is bringing the limits of the real world into an environment that doesn't need them. Now I have to be honest, tiling isn't for everyone. Not for all workflows, I mean, if you do graphic design, if you edit video professionally, if you work with photography, you often need floating windows to be able to overlap visual references of variable sizes, to have total spatial freedom. Pure tiling can be limiting in these contexts. But for writing, programming, system administration, research, web browsing, managing multiple terminals, their tiling is objectively more efficient. It's not ideology, it's geometry applied to workflow. Hyperland takes all this and finally makes it natural. You no longer have to choose between usability and efficiency. You can have both. And this is the real revolution. Tiling stops being a subculture and simply becomes the best way to do certain things. I don't know if Hyperland will evolve or disappear, but one thing I'm certain of, it has forever changed the entire metaphor of the desktop computer. And it didn't do it only on Linux, it did it universally. Remember that Windows adopted workspaces and animations precisely because both Mac and Linux had this tendency. Other systems aren't standing still. Regarding Hyperland, I like its KISS philosophy. I love the fact of having to configure each program to do a specific thing, and the results show. It's easier to understand what works, it's easier to make them work together, and when they work, they work. On stability, my personal experience has been surprisingly positive. In my abundant month of use, I've had fewer freezes than on other desktop environments. But this is my experience, on my specific hardware, with my configuration. Hyperland is young. KDE Plasma 6 and GNOME 47 are mature projects tested on millions of different machines. Your experience could vary significantly. What I actually think is that someone will come along who will put everything together, make a well-done configuration script with a graphical interface, effectively relegating configuration files to another category of users, and everything will become extremely popular. Or certainly both GNOME and KDE, whatever other desktop, Cosmic in the end does this too, will adapt. That's why Hyperland is revolutionary, and I recommend everyone to go beyond their comfort zone and try it, especially if you have a laptop with a good touchpad. A practical tip if you decide to make this leap, keep the default configurations of the distributions and Hyperland itself. Design your desktop first in your mind according to the needs you think you'll satisfy. 
And then when the whole picture is complete, get to work and piece by piece build what you want to do. Don't start making Frankenstein desktops every day. It will tire you out and above all everything will break. It takes a certain mental discipline, I believe. But then everyone works things out as they want. At least that's my point of view. Tiling, and Hyperland in particular, require a different approach compared to traditional desktop environments. It's not install and start using. It's thinking about your workflow, identifying recurring patterns, and then configuring the system to support exactly those patterns. It's an initial investment of time and reflection that then pays back enormously in daily efficiency. I understand that Hyperland isn't for everyone yet, and maybe it never will be for all types of work. But for those who can benefit from it, it's a paradigm shift worth exploring.